Hello everyone, welcome to Random Encounter 261 or 261. My name is Jonathan Logan and holy crap, do we have a big show for you today because holy crap, a Nintendo Direct just dropped. So it's around this time of the year, everyone starts getting a little twitchy about Nintendo Directs and like, oh, are we going to get one? And we got one. It was announced yesterday, we're recording this on uh, on the Thursday. So yeah, we're pretty excited about what just was announced. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about two other recent games, but uh, let's meet our panel tonight. So first up, Brian. Hey there. And Wes. Hey, everybody. Cool. So like I said, no preamble tonight. We're just going to dive right into the news. So uh, like I said, we're going to be focusing on RPG and adventure game news here. Of course, we might mention some other little things at the end of this segment that got announced that isn't part of our coverage just because we're excited about it. But uh, we'll just go through this chronologically uh, with RPG news. So we'll start with Xenoblade Chronicles 3 expansion pass details were dropped. They will be available on February 15th. So that's going to be two days uh, after you are listening to this, if you are listening to this on Monday when this episode comes out. And if you're not, why aren't you listening to this on Monday? Um, so that's kind of exciting. Have either of you played Xenoblade Chronicles 3? No, I still have to finish the first one. I have not finished it yet, but I've played quite a bit of it. I'm pretty I'm pretty deep in there. So at some point you will be ready for the DLC, but not quite yet. I will, especially once they showed old Rex looking like old Enzo from Reboot. Uh, I was over the moon. I'm over the moon that you just made that reference because I'm a massive reboot fan. <laughs> Glad to be on board. And the second arc of the third season of reboot is astounding. It's utterly incomprehensible that they actually pulled it off. I love it. The third season of reboot for those listening is, I would argue, one of the best seasons of cart of a cartoon show ever. The first two are cute, but it's a kid's show. The fourth season is a friggin mess. Uh, that I kind of enjoy, but it's a mess. But the third season, holy crap, it's good. It's, I think it's a perfect season of television. Okay, getting back to the Nintendo Direct news, now that we stopped talking about a cartoon show from the 90s. <laughs> um, if you're looking to scratch that Castlevania itch, Dead Cells Return to Castlevania is coming out soon. Apparently, uh, Konami can't be you know bothered to uh, create a new Castlevania game, at least not one that's not on mobile. So uh, the folks at Dead Cells are taking up the mantle and they are releasing a very a very Castlevania inspired uh, bunch of new levels with some new weapons and it, it looks, if I mean if you love Castlevania, it looks real good. Yeah, especially seeing all those Castlevania characters in like the Dead Cells style, that was what really wowed me looking at it. Yeah, I started playing Dead Cells uh, gosh, a couple months ago, midway through 2022 and i wasn't in the best of headspace at the time i was really really stressed out and i was and then i got about i don't know four or five hours in i was like hmm maybe playing a roguelite is not the best thing for me to be doing right now maybe i should come back to it later when i'm feeling calmer uh so yeah i i played it a bit it's really good but this looks pretty cool yeah dead cells is awesome and i'm excited to have an excuse to play it again and this looks like a great excuse to have uh, here's some adventure game news that made me squeal like a little boy on Christmas. Ghost Trick Phantom Detective is getting a Switch remaster. Oh my god. Um, now I did a podcast about Ghost Trick on, uh, with Solosi in uh, December of 2019. The link to that will be in the show notes. I am a massive fan of this game. Uh, it's from, I mean, if you love Ace Attorney, you're going to love Ghost Trick Phantom Detective. It's great. There are, it has the, arguably the best boy in video game history uh missile the dog um and it's it's just an incredible incredible game uh, amazing story uh twists turns plot twists that you'll never see coming i highly recommend it when it comes out it was on mobile um i think it still is but this looks cl- much 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 cleaner than the mobile version this is a, it's a full remaster so i highly recommend it have either of you played ghost trick phantom detective no i don't even really know a whole lot about it besides that when the trailer came on i was like i recognize that character Um, but it looked fun. It's so good. Oh my God, it's good. I've never played it, but many people like you have have told me I need to play it um, over the years. And I've been waiting and waiting for an accessible way to play it on a platform that I enjoy using. And seeing this happen, it's just like, yep, that's a day one. I I can't keep avoiding it anymore. Oh no, there's a day one for me too. I mean, I'm probably not going to play it again because I I recently played it. I've played it a few times, but like, I just want to be like, hey, Capcom, Take notice. I paid my money. Hopefully other people do too. More Give of me this, more. please. <laughs> more, please. I don't think that there, this, sh- I don't think this should have ever been uh, spun off into a franchise. It's a really good standalone game. Like it's a really good standalone story. It ends on a note that it could, could have a sequel, but I just like it by itself. Um, 
On the other hand, I could use some more Ace Attorney. Speaking of Ace Attorney, there is a game that was announced uh, called Deca Police, which looks like an intriguing mix of Ace Attorney and a turn-based RPG. The the, uh, the characters especially have a very uh, like Ace Attorney kind of Professor Layton style to them, which I really really liked. And uh, when I saw it was a turn-based RPG, I was like, oh yeah, okay, this this is definitely an R coverage. Mm-hmm. But I think this might be one of those games that just in the sheer uh, waterfall of news that was dropping and just landing on people. People, I think, just got a little bit overwhelmed. I think this is one of those things that might have slipped through the cracks in terms of people paying attention to it. Yeah, I was uh, a little distracted while the Direct was going on, so I missed the fact that it's a level 5 game, and Mm -hmm. I am such a big fan of level 5 in their prime that I want this. I want to believe. I want to believe. (laughs) Well, speaking of seeing as believing, uh, RPG fan is going to be covering a Bayonetta game. Uh, so we we don't cover Bayonetta. It's, it's it leans much much more into the action adventure genre. Uh, there are a couple of shades of RPGs, but every game has shades of RPGs nowadays. However, Bayonetta Origins uh, looks to be a pretty darn cool looking overhead action RPG. Uh, some puzzle solving elements in there. Uh, it looks adorable. Amazing voice acting, uh, and I I I think anyone who saw this trailer just was charmed like crazy. So yeah, we're going to be covering this uh, when it comes out next month, I believe. Yeah, it's hard not to look at that trailer and just like be wowed a little bit visually and artistically by it. And mm-hmm. seeing that coming out of Bayonetta and, and being something that we could actually cover, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, the the visuals really got me with that one. I, I don't even know if this is the type of game that I'm going to enjoy, but <laughs> just the visuals, I was like, oh, I kind of want to play it. <laughs> yeah, uh, the visuals look real, real nice. Um, and hopefully, I mean, from what I understand, Bayonetta 3 had a very divisive story. Uh, hopefully the story for this game is a little bit more of a, uh, a bomb to soothe the souls, the injured souls of those Bayonetta fans who did not really enjoy the third game very much. Um, well, here's some news that, uh, Brian, I know you are very excited over, uh, which is Fire Emblem Engage is already getting new content uh, because Wave 2 DLC lands today. Yes. Uh, I am excited about it. Actually, I already have it downloaded. I'll probably be playing it immediately after this podcast. I'm vaguely surprised you're even here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they added some cool characters. We have uh, Hector from Fire Emblem 7, which was the first Fire Emblem game I ever played. Soren, it looks like they went with the Radiant Dawn design for him instead of the Path of Radiance one. Uh, and then Camilla from Conquest. So I'm excited to... All three of them are going to come with a map from their game that you have to play to unlock them. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to do that tonight. That's neat. Uh, we're going to be talking about Fire Emblem Engage after we get through the the cavalcade of news that we received. So uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about, we'll give you some context on that, all that uh, in a bit. Um, Harmony, The Fall of Reverie is an adventure game coming from the developer of Life is Strange. Uh, it kind of gives me a little bit of like a, a slice of life Hades vibe because there are gods and they talk to you and it's a, it's a narrative adventure game where you can choose different paths. So I think it looks really neat, a uh, nice clean art style, nothing spectacular, but it looks like a good adventure game slash visual novel. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. Here's some news for RPG fans out there that they may not have seen coming, but makes a lot of sense when you consider the history of the series and other, uh, other series other entries uh, released by the developer octopath traveler 2 has a demo out today um so if you've been looking at octopath traveler 2 and thinking oh boy oh boy oh boy and it's coming out in just a few weeks but if you really really want to play it right now it has a demo out uh and i know that let me see here it was thursday zach should have a preview piece out uh by the time you are listening to this. So if you haven't checked that out uh, and you want to read a little bit more about Octopath Traveler 2, there should be a preview up on RPGFan.com right now. So check that out. Are either of you excited for Octopath Traveler 2? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's I don't even know why I had to ask that, but yeah. yeah the first one wasn't quite my speed, but I think a lot of that are small little nitpicks that the sequel, from what I hear, will be ironing out a bit. So I'm excited to get my hands on this demo and see, like, okay, have they hit the balance that will really work for me this time around? It's so interesting. I I enjoyed Octopath Traveler. I really enjoyed the battle system. Obviously, the graphic style were astounding. And I actually really enjoyed the characters in isolation because unfortunately, that's the only way I could enjoy the characters <laughs> was in isolation. Um, so yeah, if they have added more character interaction, a more overarching story, 
uh, while somehow still maintaining the uh, the sense of the individual characters moving forward, because it is Octopath Traveler, like it's, you know, eight characters, all, fe all featuring the same classes as the original game. So it'll be interesting to see what spin they put on each one of these classes to differentiate the characters from their uh, predecessors. Yeah, I think it's going to be exciting to kind of get to learn, you know, eight brand new characters and and to see how they weave together. It's that, that battle system, regardless of any of my feelings about the rest of the game, was absolutely stellar. And being able to do that with a whole new group is exciting. Oh, so much fun. I'm excited to hear the soundtrack, too. That was one of my favorite mm -hmm. soundtracks the year it came out. So I'm super excited to hear more. Oh, yeah. And I mean, given uh, given how popular the soundtrack was, I feel like we might get more. I Like, I mean, Break Boost and Beyond live it, it was a it was a the it was a blu-ray concert and also just break boost it was astoundingly good and i have the um i have the 16-bit uh uh version on my shelf and it's just so good so yeah real excited about the music too i understand where you're coming from there 100 percent um in more uh i guess retro style rpg news that everyone uh is losing their minds over for very good reason uh sea of stars has a release date of august 29th and the unexpected part is there's a demo out uh we should have something up pretty soon regarding the demo but if you are out there and you have seen this game and you thought oh my god this looks so good yeah check it out play the demo because you can um I, again i don't think i even need to ask this question but both of you are pretty psyched for sea of stars right yeah, I mean, it looks cool to me. I'm excited to play it. I've been looking for the thing to get me really invested in it because it does look absolutely gorgeous, but mm -hmm. I need that one little push, and I think the demo could be that one little push for me. So I'm pretty jazzed that we got that kind of out of the clear blue sky today. It is becoming harder uh, for these games to come out. I feel like every indie RPG that comes out, I'm like, wow, this game looks like a gorgeous, fun, turn-based RPG. Uh I, I do agree there has to be a little more now than maybe there needed to be mm -hmm. five, ten years ago. Yeah, it's a more crowded space than it was, for sure. It very much is. And, I mean, The Messenger is a great, great game. Really, really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed its DLC, too, so I'm excited to see what this team does. I have to admit that I was more excited about Sea of Star. I was more excited for Sea of Stars uh, before I played Chained Echoes. And now I'm like, okay, that Chained Echoes scratched the exact itch in the exact place that I was wanting Sea of Stars to scratch. And now I'm like, well, I still want to play it, obviously, but a little bit less so now that I, I've, I've gotten that experience, that retro experience with a modern edge from Chained Echoes. So we'll see what happens with Sea of Stars for me. I, what the hell am I talking about? I'm going to enjoy it. I think everyone is. It looks really, really good. Yeah, e even if I'm a little bit of a doubter uh, about some kind, some styles of indie RPGs, I don't doubt this one's going to impress. I mean, they've got a pedigree on it, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's move into some remasters that are coming out because mm -hmm. it seems like there's a lot of remasters coming out right now. Uh, there were quite a few announced in this and quite a few were enthusiastically greeted by the RPG fan staff. Uh, Etrian Odyssey Origins Collection is going to be a remastered collection of the first three games. Uh, it will be coming out on June 1st. This is not a series that I played or know anything about, but based on the reaction, people really like this series. Oh, yes. Beyond enthused about, about getting Etrian Odyssey on Switch. People have been wondering for ages, how are they going to do it? How are they going to pull it off? The mm -hmm. mapping features that they have there look like they'll be pretty robust, look like they'll be able to make it work, because the real fun of Etrian Odyssey is kind of that exploration, that making your map, kind of finding your way through a dungeon, mm -hmm. um, way more so than any kind of story-based experience, and it's the best at it. So hopefully mm -hmm. they pull this off. It works well on the Switch. It looks beautiful. The new art's great. I don't know. I'm, I'm over the moon that this mm. came out of here. What yeah, we... I'll, I'll be interested to see how the mapping works out because the, the original games took really good advantage of the hardware. And I see they have the auto mapping in this game, but I wonder if that like takes away from the fun of making your map a bit. Like I feel like making the map manually is kind of part of the <laughs> point of Etrian Odyssey. Mm. But we'll see. I hope it's good. Yeah, it looks like there's still at least partial like mapping for yourself, like with objects that you interact with and stuff. And I'm hoping that'll scratch the itch enough to to still make it feel like Etrian Odyssey. Uh, I think what probably will end up happening with this one is very similar to what we had to do with the uh, Castlevania Advanced Collection, which is rather than get one person to review the entire collection, we might get like three people to do almost mini reviews on each game. 
I'll have to think about that a little bit first. If someone is willing to tackle the entire remastered collection, that would be great. But it's not like this is a small series of games, like, you know, a couple hours of playtime each. It, it seems like it's a pretty, it would be a meal to any for any reviewer Absolutely. individually. So yeah. we'll see what happens there, but we have a few months until that comes out. Um, in news that has excited oh many a person, including myself, Advanced Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp finally has a new release date, which is April 21st. Uh, Advanced Wars 1 Plus 2 was, uh, was infamously delayed uh, because of the Ukrainian war. And Nintendo, I, I, I don't want to be cynical about this, but I, I think that Nintendo was like, this will last a few months and then it'll be done and, you know, we'll, we'll release it then. And it, it wasn't and hasn't and doesn't look like it's going to be over anytime soon. Though so I think that Nintendo just kind of got tired of having this war game sitting around collecting dust uh, and just said, screw it, let's release it. Part of me was hoping after all this time we were going to get like a really close release date or even a shadow drop, but just mm. seeing it happen at all. I'm over the moon about. I thought it was going to be a shadow drop too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm psyched for this one. This was, I feel like I started playing Advance Wars around the same time I started playing Fire Emblem and it was kind of a coin flip, which one I was going to become addicted to for the next 15 years of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so I'm excited to go back and play it again. I Not for nothing, but I think you made the right choice considering the sheer number of games. Yeah. I'm certainly eating better as a Fire Emblem fan <laughs> yes. than I would have been as an Advance Wars fan. I mean, I guess you would have had Famicom Wars, Game Boy Wars, and Super Famicom Wars. But after that, I mean, what what else is there? The spinoff Battalion Wars, was that for GameCube, I think? Yeah, you had the GameCube spinoff. You had a couple on the DS. And then that was about it. Yeah, you had one that was an, a direct sequel to uh, 1 and 2. And you also had Days of Rune, I think it was, which was actually amazing. Uh, although it certainly was a darker take on the subject matter. Yeah, that was something they did with... Uh those DS tactical RPGs, because it was the same way with the DS Fire Emblem games. They went with a much more like muted, darker palette. Uh, they're all good games. So I guess the most recent game that would be very similar to this would have been Wargroove, which was directly inspired by Advanced Wars. I love Wargroove uh, and I love Advanced Wars. So I am really, really happy that this is finally getting uh, released. Uh, and that will definitely be something that we review for the site. Um, speaking of older games that are getting released, uh, Nintendo made a big announcement today involving Switch Online, which is Game Boy and Game Boy Advanced games are going to be coming to Switch Online. Uh, there's quite a list of them. Uh, I think they're starting out relatively limited, uh, but if you are looking for some great RPGs, like, well, I guess, and RPG likes, uh, Link's Awakening DX is going to be there. The Minish Cap is there. Uh, the one that I think is the coolest is Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga is coming out. Uh, uh, for the Switch Online, which is just an amazing RPG. Um, and the beginning of a pretty darn cool series as well. And there are other games that look like they're going to be coming out into the near future, including Golden Sun, which people have been clamoring for for a long time. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Are you happy, are either of you happy that Nintendo uh, Switch Online has expanded their offerings? I am happy they expanded it. There's some GBA games I'm pretty excited about. They had Fire Emblem 7, Metroid Fusion, and Golden Sun on there. I wish it wasn't attached to a subscription fee. Like, I wish I could just buy the games. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess I'll take what I can get. Yeah, uh, at some point. The way, they're do the way they're doling these things out, I don't think that we're going to be looking at a Fire Emblem collection at any point in the near future. Although that would be an interesting way to handle the release of so many games that have never been you know, put out on uh, in the Western market. I think that they've done a good job. Like they definitely upped the value in a pretty significant way for their switch online plus expansion pack with the GBA games. Mm -hmm. um, they might've finally sold me on it. I, I put Mario and Luigi on the same pedestal as Mario RPG and the thousand year door. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, bonus. I love WarioWare and the original is still mm -hmm. kind of the most fun I have with it. Not an RPG, but I love it. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of an RPG if you're going by like, <laughs> If you strip everything out of Yakuza but the minigames, it's kind of like an RPG. <laughs> there you go. Oh, wow. Wario would be a perfect Yakuza character now that I think about it. Like, oh he would God. just fit into that world beautifully. <laughs> I could imagine beating him up at a nightclub. Oh, man, that uh, that works disturbingly well in my mind. Um, let's move on now to a new game. Uh, Master Detective Archives Raincode now has a release date of June 30th. 
Uh, again, this is another kind of detective style game. In this case, you team up with a group of detectives who have supernatural abilities and you use them to solve crimes. Uh, I think it looks really, really cool. This was announced a few months ago. This is the most we've seen of it, though. I, you know, it's the kind of game that I would really enjoy playing, I think. Yeah, this one looks like a blast to me. And I know I've said this a few times, but it's still true. I loved the visuals on this one. It mm -hmm. looks really fun. It looks unique. I love it. You got a lot of the team behind Danganronpa on it. I'm going to at least check it out. Like, mm -hmm. that's <laughs> that's enough for me uh, to earn interest, if nothing else. Yeah, it has some uh, pedigree behind it. Um, we also have Fantasy Life. Is this supposed to be Fantasy Life 1 or Fantasy Life I? Fantasy Life I. Fantasy Life I, The Girl Who Steals Time, is coming out by the end of 2023. Uh, apparently she stole the release date. So we will maybe see a sequel to Fantasy Life uh, at some point this year. Yeah, that's that was surprising to me. Fantasy Life is one of those that I was always interested in, but just never hopped on the wagon before it was you know, kind of past its time. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm excited for a second chance to to dip in. Um, I know nothing about the sequel, though. It feels like we barely touched the surface of it. It was just an announcement. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there were a few just announcements in this, uh, in this direct, including one that made me almost drop out of my seat, uh, which is holy crap, a new professor Layton game. Yeah. Uh, what the what? <laughs> yeah, I know. It was like, what? I recognize that profile. Holy crap. So it's Professor Layton and the new World of Steam announced. And I swear to God, this isn't me making a a, a clever joke or anything. When I first thought saw the logo, I, I, I don't I thought I swear to God, I thought it said Professor Layton Wolfenstein instead of Wolf, World <laughs> of Steam. And I was like, that's a crossover I never thought we'd ever get. Very different game than what we're probably getting. <laughs> Uh, yes, I would imagine that. Uh, I I would not hate... I kind of like when franchises uh, do crossovers that make no sense on paper or otherwise. Uh, and that would have been one of the craziest I can possibly imagine. But my speculation about uh, Professor Layton Wolfenstein aside, that's all we really got. We didn't get any real information about the game gameplay or anything. It was just a trailer. Pretty slick looking. But, you know, hopefully we get more in the future. Um and hopefully pretty soon. Speaking of things that are coming in the very near future, I sincerely doubt it is our last trailer, but I think it is one of the last trailers of The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Now, uh, this was closing out the Nintendo Direct. I mean, it looks fabulous. It, wonderful music. Hyrule is, it doesn't look like Hyrule is doing very well, and that's saying something considering that the last game was set post-apocalypse. It looks like they're going through another apocalypse. Um, we have uh, a lot more gameplay, a lot more interesting interesting gameplay mechanics. Uh, for example, Link now, instead of, his, uh, instead of his ancient iPad, he now has a power glove, um, which he is using to manipulate items. That's an upgrade. It's an upgrade, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an upgrade. He's, got, he's, he's getting rid of the touchpad. He's going to gesture-based. It's gesture-based now. It's the future. He is driving several contraptions in the uh, trailer, including what looks to be like kind of a, a makeshift Jeep, a, a weird flying machine. Um, what I like about this is it almost reminds me, I, I don't know if either of you have seen some of the uh, the game-breaking uh, exploits that many people on YouTube have played with, but one of them is you can create a like a contraption flying machine uh, by using uh, the magnetic powers if you have two mining carts and you put them side by side and you can make Link fly. Uh, I have to admit, when I was looking at this, I was like, this reminds me of that. You kind of wonder if Nintendo saw this and just said, you know what? That's not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People love the physics engine in this game. Let's let's have a little more fun with it. Well, that was my theory that I posted in the, uh, in the RPG fan Slack is they'll never do this in a million years, but it would be very funny if the way that Link first gets to all of the islands in the sky is he jumps off the Temple of Time and ricochets his shield off a moblin down there and goes flying into the sky. If they worked that into canon uh, as the, the classic speedrunning strat, that would be amazing. He's going to save the speedrun strats. But that's the one, like the one that sends him completely flying into the air. If that's how they got to the island in the first place, uh, that would be that would make me happy. Or if they put some kind of a reference in there, like a sly one. They won't, but it would make me happy. It would be amazing. What did uh, both of you make of this trailer? It was cool. Uh, I was not, I, I'm one of the, the minority of people that was not in love with Breath of the Wild. Mm -hmm. This looked a little neater to me. Um, I liked the kind of darker tone that it had. 
Um, we're certainly going to be getting it here because uh, my fiance loved Breath of the Wild. So I'll be watching her play it and probably give it a shot myself. Brian, I feel like we have a lot in common on this one because <laughs> Zelda as a whole is a series. I, I more so watch my wife play that I play myself. Uh, and I actually like Breath of the Wild a lot more than I like most Zelda games. And I don't hate any Zelda games. They're just not quite my speed. But um, this still looks cool. I'm excited to see it played or or to mess around with it a little bit. I know that there's no way I'm going to get as invested as a lot of people do. But um, you know how sometimes you're just happy for other people to have nice things? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about Breath of the Wild. Uh, and tears of the kingdom i can relate to enjoying watching your partner play uh breath of the wild i mean i i played the breath of the wild and i was somebody who was extremely positive about it but then amanda played it and i think i mentioned on the podcast before she played it in a very different way than i did um spending like hours searching for bugs and individual like like animals and she would try to figure out like the best coordination of uh, the best coordination of costume pieces to give to give link a look and uh, also, she considers herself to be the official gardener of Hyrule with the the master shears. Um, so she will just cut grass. That's that's her thing in every Zelda game that she's ever played. She just loves cutting grass more than anything. And there's a lot of grass in Breath of the Wild. So she was very happy cutting grass. It's impressive how satisfying the Zelda series has made cutting grass. Well, that's the joke that we make is like for most people when at the very beginning of the game, when Link comes out of the hibernation chamber and he looks out upon Hyrule and he's like, oh, no. This this uh, it's going to take me some a while to get this sorted out. And Amanda's link goes out and says, "Oh no, the yard is overgrown." <laughs> and just the rest of the game is him just trying to figure out how to cut the lawn, essentially. And Zelda going, "You idiot! I'm in here. Save me!" And him being like, "The uh, frankly, Zelda, you, the the yard in front of the castle looks terrible. I've got to I've got to clean this up. Got to hope that one of the the vehicles in Tears of the Kingdom is a riding mower then." Oh my God, I didn't even think of that. I'm going to mention that to her when she gets home. She'll lose her mind at that idea. Um, So yeah, that was the direct. Uh, Is there any other news that either of you would like to mention uh, that I did not mention because it's not necessarily RPG fan related? Did we bring up Bot and Kytos? Oh crap, I completely, no, I did not. Uh, (laughs) Because that one's very important to me. (laughs) Yes, you're right. It absolutely is. How did I miss that? I missed it because I, (laughs) I missed it because I accidentally deleted my talking point when I was looking over it. (laughs) Um, But yeah, let's talk about that one. Go. I mean, this is an absolutely amazing series from the GameCube. It's it's maybe the most I've ever liked Matoi Sakuraba's music. I am notably kind of up and down on him as a composer, despite being a lifelong Tales fan. But oh, man, the 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 music sounds so good. The game is absolutely gorgeous. It's going to look even better in HD. And I'm a sucker for card based gameplay. I'm (laughs) such a sucker for card games and Man, does this scratch that itch. Both games, especially the second game. I think a lot of people didn't get a chance to try the second game and are going to be really impressed by what they missed out on. Yeah, well, it's coming out in a few months. And uh, I know that I know that many people on staff, again, when it was announced, they lost their mind. Sorry, I didn't mention that there. I've... uh, like I said, when you have a when you have a, a, a mass dump of news, sometimes it's easy to let things slip through the cracks. Uh, and in this particular case, I let this one go. So yeah, it's coming out uh, by the end of summer, I believe. So we don't have a release date yet, but you know, so that'll be any time before like September twentieth or whatever the last day of summer is. I like to think we gave it the place of honor at the end where it really needed to be. <laughs> um, I mean, the news that got me confused as hell genuinely confused is metroid prime remastered um holy crap yeah i on the one hand holy crap yeah metroid prime remastered this is amazing on the other hand just metroid prime remastered yeah like that was that made me go what really just the first game you guys know there are two others right and most people identify not most people but I, i think a certain almost generation of gamers think of Metroid Prime not in the Metroid Prime 1, 2, and 3, but they think about it as the collection. Like, it's almost like a... Absolutely. It's a, it's a package deal for Metroid Prime. And the fact that they're releasing them in individual packages means, A, maybe they, you know, don't have enough manpower and they just don't want to hold on to Metroid Prime remastered until they have remastered 2 and 3. There's also a possibility that they know that people will buy them individually and they want to earn much more money from it that's kind of my expectation i'm i'm still expecting remasters of the other two to come out they just didn't want to release them all at once because metroid fans are hungry they'll they'll go and double and triple dip maybe if they uh 
if they time it out properly, that maybe they think that if they released all three of them at once, people would just get impatient for four. But if they if they space it out properly, it'll be like steps, steps you're gently climbing to get to the new title. Well, that was my concern. I was like, this leads me to believe Prime 4 is a long way off because if they're spacing out the releases, I have to think 4 isn't coming until all three of those are out. I know that there are hacked versions on... Uh, like if the originals now that have fan based uh, PC controls. So using a uh, keyboard and mouse uh, to play it because it's a first person shooter. Uh, apparently it's amazing. It's an amazing uh, fan hack. And that was how I was going to uh, play it for the first time in a long time. Cause I was like, wow, I really like to play it. Now I'm not so sure. Cause this does going to, it is going to have dual stick controls. Uh, so more modern controls as compared to what it was when it was originally released. So yeah, it looks to be like it'll update the series and give people a new entry point into this uh, amazing side series of the Metroid uh, franchise. <laughs> That's the end of uh, our Nintendo Direct coverage. Uh, we might reference it more, you know, talking about this. But yeah, it, it was a, it was a pretty damn good Direct. I was pretty darn happy about it. I couldn't have been happier about some of the announcements, and there were a few surprises in there. Silk Song wasn't in there, but oh well, <laughs> it never will be. Uh, but yeah, so that that that's pretty that's pretty much it for the the direct. Do any of you either of you have thoughts about it? I thought it was a good one. Yeah, I like the Pikmin dog. Oh yeah, Pikmin Pikmin Four. There's a dog now. That's excellent. Now with dog. There were a couple of things I was kind of hoping to see that I didn't. Mostly in the world of Final Fantasy and release dates for Pixel Remaster, but you know, setting those aside, it was amazing. There was a lot of good stuff. There was some Katamari, which I promised myself I'd sneak in here somewhere. Mm-hmm. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, it's it's it was a lovely direct. I think people who are really wanting a new one to come up soon are pretty happy with it, most likely. I think that they would be, too. I don't think a lot of people would be disappointed by this direct. I think there was something for everybody. Well, much like Metroid having been a Nintendo franchise that uh, exploded in popularity in recent years, there is another Nintendo franchise that has exploded in popularity in the last few years after chugging along for decades in relative obscurity, and that is Fire Emblem. Uh, I think Fire Emblem Three Houses really broke through with a lot of people, and uh, people were, you know, giant fans of it. And uh, they, there was a new big release called Fire Emblem Engage, which is a celebration of the entire history of the franchise from its humble beginnings on the Famicom to the most recent hit, Fire Emblem Three Houses. Uh, Brian, uh, you have what I would could only describe as an epic multi-part uh, project review project for the site, which is you are covering all of the Fire Emblem games, including fan translations of entries that were never released in the West. Uh, what? Why? Why did you just decide to tackle this monumental task? Uh, I, I wish I had a better answer than this, but it's really just because I like Fire Emblem. I, I'm pretty much constantly replaying a Fire Emblem game <laughs> all the time. So I was like, why don't I just play through the whole series and then I can say I've played them all. And at this point, uh, I'm up to Fire Emblem. I just finished a review for Fire Emblem 7. Um, and at other points in my life, I've played everything after that. So I have played all of the mainline entries now. How many do you have left? Uh, to review, um, yeah. depending on whether you count Fates as one or three, uh, either eight or 11. Uh, 12 if you count... Uh, the Satellaview title. No big deal. Can we review the Satellaview title? Uh, you can emulate it. All right, we'll talk about that later. Uh, for now, let's actually talk about the latest entry, uh, Engage. Yeah. Star Trek fan, every time I hear Engage, you know what I hear. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's engage. Uh, so uh, this is a re- this is the next big one. Uh, what separates this game from the rest of the series? Um, so actually, I would say Engage feels very much like a return. Um, to uh, kind of the roots of the series. Maybe not the roots, maybe like the 10 years ago of the series. Uh, After Three Houses was kind of a very serious uh, political drama type story, Mm -hmm. uh, Engage feels very similar to more like Awakening and Fates, where it's a little more lighthearted. The story is less serious. um, and And the gameplay, we've moved away from kind of the features that were war related. So we don't have like, the little armies that each of your units commands and we don't have classes for you to recruit units from so you can uh, educate them Mm -hmm. um you know we're back to a 
kind of high fantasy war story where you're recruiting enemies and uh, neutral units from uh, during the battles. Um, so it's a good nostalgia kick in that way. I would say the big standout feature, though, is the emblem rings, mm-hmm. uh, which is a new feature for this game. Uh, there are a bunch of items called emblem rings, one for each game in the series, uh, and they each have a character from them, and you can equip them to a unit, and it kind of fuses them with a character from a previous game. So, like, uh, Marth is one of them. So you can put the Marth ring on someone, and they get some abilities that are kind of themed after Marth. Uh, and that's a lot of fun. It, it really does feel like a celebration of the rest of the franchise where you get to see all of these old characters come back. Uh, one problem often, though, with that kind of fan service is that it can dramatically impact the quality of the overall story. Now, in your review that you mentioned that the story gets a little campy in places. It's not quite as epic or serious as other entries, other recent entries anyway. So you aren't a giant fan of this somewhat weak story? Yes, that is my one major criticism. I do think Engage's story is probably a bottom three story in the franchise, uh, although not because of the emblems. Oh, okay. uh, the emblems are actually a fairly minor part of the story. They're just kind of a MacGuffin. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. The, sto- the, the writing in this one for the story just uh, didn't quite do it for me, uh, especially at the beginning. It, the writing feels almost juvenile. There's a lot of like silly jokes and one note characters, which isn't necessarily a problem. I think you can tell a simple story and tell it well, but it's like not a jokey story. Like once you get past the early game, it clearly it's a game that clearly wants you to take it seriously. There's a bunch of emotional scenes, but they rarely build up to them, uh, which just makes makes the emotional scenes not work, except for a couple in the mid game that are actually very good. But for the most part, the emotional scenes just didn't hit for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think on like subsequent playthroughs, I will probably be skipping the story more often than I do in other Fire Emblem replays. Okay, well, on the plus side, even though it has a somewhat weak story, it's apparently an exceptionally fun game, which bodes well for future entries in the series. Uh, Let's talk about for just a second, uh, the combat in Fire Emblem Engage. Uh, How does this combat system work here and what sets it apart from uh, others in the franchise? Yeah, so now that I've I've finished two playthroughs of the game, one on hard and one on maddening, uh, I, I think I'm ready to make the statement that I think this is the best gameplay in the series. Uh, the combat is great. They brought the weapon triangle back. That was gone in the last game, but they changed it. Uh, it historically, it's usually just attacking with weapon triangle advantage, which is like a rock, paper, scissors thing. Swords beat axes, axes beat lances, lances beat swords. Mm-hmm. And usually if you were attacking with advantage, that meant your weapon was a little more accurate and you did a little more damage. Uh, In this one, they changed it to a new system called the break system, where if you attack someone and you have the advantage, uh, they don't get to counterattack you at all. uh, And they don't get to counter counter counterattack the next person that attacks them either. So this makes it really important, especially on player phase, uh, to attack with weapon triangle advantage, because it means you can take your squishy units and, you know, they're not going to get hit back by the enemies, which is great because the enemies are really tough in this game on Maddening. Even towards the end game, a lot of your units can only take one or two hits. So you have to be careful in thinking about like, okay, can I break this enemy so that I can safely attack him with my other units? Uh, hmm. Which is a, a an interesting wrinkle that you don't really have with the old weapon triangle system. Well, you I mean, you gave the game a 90, so clearly you had a great time with it. And unfortunately, it's a shame that it was... It's been separated by one of the weakest stories in Fire Emblem versus one of the strongest uh, gameplay uh, feels of the series. Uh, I, there are, like we, ta- wait, like we said, there's like 20 entries in this series. Where approximately would you place it in your Fire Emblem ranking? It's hard to say. Uh, I think it's probably sitting just outside of the top five, probably six or seven. Uh, one of the other things that I really like about this one is there's a ton of uh, unit customization and incentive to kind of have like a varied team composition. Hmm. Um, each emblem ring has like a bunch of abilities attached to it. And it's interesting deciding which unit is going to make the best use of those abilities. Like one of the rings, the Lin ring, uh, makes the unit you put it on really fast. So you can either put it on a slow unit, like uh, a general, like a big heavy armored unit, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then all of a sudden they can start double attacking enemy units. Um, or you can give it to a fast unit and make sure they're doubling absolutely everything. Uh, and there's a lot of decision points like that. And then as you get later in the game, you can have units even inherit some of the abilities from the rings, and then you can use them even when the ring's not on them, uh, which means you can combine it with a different ring that you put on them. So there's tons of ways to mix and match, which makes for a lot of replay value too, because I really think you could play this game a dozen times with a dozen different team compositions, and right. it would completely change the way that you need to play the maps. Yeah. because your units are capable of doing totally different things each time. So with the uh, with the envelope or with it sounds like it's a variation of a job system essentially. So like a kind of like a job system. I guess very similar cuz you can swap them around at will, but if you leave it on a unit for longer, they can level it up much like a job. Mm -hmm. Um and if they master it, they can continue with those skills. Yes. So so it is similar to a job system in that way. I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. Hmm. Uh, Wes, you have also been playing this game, haven't you? I sure have. Have you been enjoying it as much as Brian? I think so. Um, I I am absolutely amazed that I have not had issues with the story. I agree 100% with Brian's take on the story, and usually I'm a story-first player. But the gameplay is so good, and putting together a team feels so right, that the fact that there's not a story I'm engaging with, like, I don't care. <laughs> and that doesn't that doesn't happen to me. Um which is just absolutely amazing. This is, you know, maybe my favorite from the the modern era of Fire Emblem, um, which is pretty impressive because I've been hot and cold on the series for a long time. Some entries I adore, some I'm a little less so on. But um, Brian's review kind of hit the nail right on the <laughs> right on the head <laughs> um, with with so much of what makes this game like still absolutely amazing despite some shortcomings. Um, I'd, I'd recommend it to anyone. Like I think this is a surprisingly solid first entry for folks mm -hmm. um just because that you know it's got the difficulty modes that's become commonplace and and standard and even at you know my casual behind playing um <laughs> casual normal um i still ha get to engage with the combat system and that's that's rare for an easy mode to still like allow you to to play with the systems that well uh I'm going to be completely uh, transparent and tell you that, both of you, that I have never been able to get into Fire Emblem. I've tried a few games, and I just can't seem to crack into them. Um, and that's not saying, I mean, I love SRPGs. I guess I was, I guess I went the other, the other uh, path in the forest, which was the, uh, which was Advanced Wars, when I had that option of picking which one to go to. So I, I picked Advanced Wars. Um but Fire Emblem is, again, it's one of those series that I constantly feel like I should take a really hard run at and see if I can break in and connect to one of them. Uh, and a very good resource for that is, like we mentioned earlier, the fact that, Brian, you keep reviewing the darn things. Uh, hilariously, um, immediately after Engage, you also we also released another Fire Emblem review. Uh, a retro review, this one for Fire Emblem for the Game Boy Advanced, which was originally titled in Japan Fire Emblem the Blazing Blade. But since it was the first uh, Fire Emblem title to ever actually make it to the West, I think they decided to shorten it, understandably so. Um, as the first Fire Emblem game that folks here in the West got, do you think it was a good representative of the series? Yeah, I think Fire Emblem 7, uh, that's Blazing Blade is the 7th entry. Yep. Um is a great entry point to the series. It's actually the first one that has like a full length tutorial. Oh, um, that sounds helpful. When you start the game, uh, and you have to do this whether you're a series veteran or a new player. So if you're a series veteran, maybe this is actually not too appealing. But there's like a 10 chapter mini story that is a tutorial for how to play the game hmm. um, before you get into kind of what, what I would call the the bulk of Fire Emblem 7. And then once you get past that, it's very much like a normal Fire Emblem game. Um, there's two separate stories to play. The first time you play it, you'll play Ella Wood's story. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second time you'll play Hector's story, uh, which is like a slightly different version of the first story. It focuses on the game has three main characters um, and Hector's mode focuses on Hector instead of Ella Wood. Um, and it has a few extra chapters and it's a little more difficult. So there's a ton of replay value in it. Well, I guess there's two ways to look at it. Either there's a ton of replay value or you have to play it two times before you can play the hardest difficulty. Um, 
So that can be a pro or a con, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but I think it's a very approachable game. It has tons of difficulty options. So if you're a new player, you can play it on Elowood normal mode. And if you're a veteran, you can play it on Hector hard mode and you'll both have a good experience. Uh, the only the thing that I thought was interesting playing this again is I remember it having a much better story than it did. Uh, perhaps because I played it when I was a kid, maybe my standards have just gone up a bit. Um, but at the, interestingly, the story has a lot more contrivances and issues than I remember. It still has great characters that kind of carry it. Mm -hmm. um, and some of this is also, I learned, due to translation errors. Uh, there's a couple things that happened in it where I was like, this doesn't make any sense. And then when I looked it up, I was like, oh, that's because it's translated wrong. Um, but overall, really great entry point, fun gameplay, some of my favorite characters, and not just because of nostalgia. I really think it has one of the best Fire Emblem casts, um, and that makes up for a lot of the shortcomings in the writing. And the gameplay is a lot of fun, too. What was your first Fire Emblem game? Uh, this was my first one. Okay, cool. Wes, what was yours? Same one. Played it at launch. I was so excited for the series to hit the West. No, I mean, that's the coolest thing about it. I mean, it was a, even at that point in time, it was a very long running series. So uh, I'm glad that it eventually got here. And I am very glad that it has gained a certain amount of respect and uh, popularity uh, based on its more recent entries. So hopefully that will continue. Well, I mean, like I said, Fire Emblem is an especially long-running franchise, and long-running franchises can be a little tricky to get into, uh, but Fire Emblem is nothing compared to the game that we're about to talk about, which is One Piece Odyssey. <laughs> so, Wes, you recently reviewed One Piece Odyssey. Um, as you mentioned in the intro of your review, there are over 1,000 chapters in the manga and over 1,000 episodes of the anime series. That's a lot. Yeah, uh, it's really hard to get someone new introduced into One Piece in the modern day. <laughs> I can understand it. This is the kind of thing when I first saw this, I, I knew of One Piece and I was like, oh, this looks really, really cool. And then I like went on the wiki page. I was like, oh, nope, not right now. <laughs> Maybe when I'm dead and I have some time, but not right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now there's a video game to add to that list. I mean, there are a lot of video games, but this one is a original story. Uh, which mm -hmm. theoretically will make the game more accessible to folks who have never watched or read the series before, right? Theoretically, yes. In practice, a little <laughs> bit less so. <laughs> okay. Um, um, the, the graphic style is also something that might uh, get some people on board. It was uh, The developer was ILCA. Is it ILCA or ICLA? I'm going to say ILCA because ICLA just sounds weird. Yes. I'm going with that too. Yeah, it's the same company uh, who developed Dragon Quest XI, which explains a similarity of graphic style. It's very, it's anime, like shaded. It looks gorgeous. Um, so let, let's talk about this for a sec. So what is the central conceit of, without any big spoilers, what's hmm. the central conceit of One Piece? And then what's the story of One Piece Odyssey? So One Piece has a very simple premise about a, a young man who wants to become king of the pirates by finding... Um, a huge treasure left um, by the previous King of the Pirates. Now, de defining King of the Pirates is, is, you know, it's something we don't worry about too much. <laughs> this is just someone who who is clearly, you know, the best pirate in a world of pirates. Clearly. And he, he recruits crew members aboard his ship. It's a big battle-focused kind of a thing. But he's got this big, robust... Uh, crew with all kinds of different absolutely buck wild characters who have their own unique ways of fighting and, and combat maybe the least ridiculous of which is a guy who fights with three swords one of which is in his mouth hmm. <laughs> and it it allows for like some really unique action scenes and it allows for like really unique character moments because they are you know they butt heads but they're all kind of like this this found family um it's a good combination that people you know, can really invest in over the course of a thousand chapters or episodes. You'd have um, to. You, you would have to. Um, when I look at something and I think that when I when it rivals Doctor Who levels of <laughs> holy crap, just the history of this thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's fans are diehards. Um, mm -hmm. You you tend to find two kinds of people. One are people who are, you know, oh god, I can't believe there's a thousand to catch up on. I'll never do this. And the other ones are like, I can't believe there's only a thousand. I need more. <laughs> Which side do you fall on? 
I transition into the latter. Uh, you you eventually it's 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 a journey from one to the other. I think you may never make that journey, but you will inevitably end up in the second camp eventually. So what's the story of this one? So uh, the Straw Hats, uh, the pirate crew in question, the Straw Hat are the Straw Hat pirates, and they find themselves shipwrecked um, from being blasted up out of the ocean by by a freak jet stream. Um, and crashing upon this island that has all kinds of these weird different architecture from over the course of the series. Um, they, you know, they visit all these different islands, all these different places, and this seems to have pieces of a lot of the most historically important ones. Um, so there's something to this island um, that is more than it seems and is worth, especially to a few members of the crew, delving deeper into and trying to figure out, okay, what the heck is up with this? Mm-hmm. Um, but the, you know, pretty quick in, they lose their powers to... Uh, Yet another girl with special power. Everyone's got special powers. It's just part of One Piece. Um, Who seals their abilities away in cubes, which is how you get the prerequisite beginning of Metroid. You need to lose all your abilities. These characters are Mm -hmm. too strong. Yeah. Um, And you have to go back and kind of find these pieces to get back to your full strength. And you do so by jumping into memories of their previous adventures. There are four adventures laid out here from throughout the series history. Um, And you kind of delve back into those and re-experience the events with some slight changes, because as they say a lot, memories are fuzzy, they're they're mutable. Mm -hmm. And in between each one of those memory sections, you're exploring this island and figuring out more about the mysteries of it and its whopping two inhabitants. The the Dragon Quest feel is very strong here with a, a lot of the design, though. You know, the the char- the enemy designs made by a, a famed manga artist um, feels a lot like looking at Dragon Quest. So this island is really made to showcase um, the designs of the original manga artist in a pretty significant way. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that there is some, I guess, palette swap characters or palette swap monsters. Yes. Um, there's definitely some of that in there. Occasionally they're given the dragon quest treatment where they get a new hat or something like that. Um, but it's the a ma- new hat, <laughs> but she's got a new hat. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of the time, um, you know, you'll find one or two new enemy types in a, in a new area. And then otherwise you'll find the, the same monkeys and snails and gorillas that you've been fighting in, you know, a dozen other places. Um, mm. just looking a little bit different, maybe themed a little bit better to the area that they're in. Um, but yeah, palette swaps are definitely the order of the day there. Well, speaking of, uh, fighting these monsters, how does combat work in this game? It is, it is turn-based, but it's not quite classic turn-based, just boring it there. There's a twist on it, right? Yeah, it is. And it's honestly one of the most interesting parts of the game is that it's, it's a quadrant based turn-based system where there are four quadrants, um, to fight through and your characters and the enemies may occupy any number of them. So you might have like one quadrant with one character and four enemies in it. You might have one that just has an enemy in it and no, none of your characters and your attacks can move you. But if you are in, you know, locked in with an enemy um, without a special ability, you can't move or affect any of the other quadrants. So it's this balancing act of, okay, someone's in danger in this quadrant. I need to have like swap my party on the fly. Like FF 10, you can do it anytime you want. Oh, that's nice. Um, and okay, maybe I need to pull in a long range person so that I can clear out the, uh, this, you know, endangered um, character. And the game even will reward you more so for that. Occasionally it'll pop up these little drama scenes that say, oh, defeat uh, this enemy before they defeat your character because their power is super increased. And if you defeat them, you get an experience bonus that's like double the normal experience you'd gain from the battle. So they really encourage you to to play with this system and they do a really good job of like introducing you to it. Um, and I mean, it's got so many things layered on top of that, a skill system for increasing your, your battle abilities an equipment system. That's kind of an abstract puzzle sequence. Um, not to mention it's very own weapon triangle, <laughs> um, where each of your characters belong to power technique or speed. And they have, you know, a rock, paper, scissors relationship with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, which speaks to why you're swapping in characters so often you want to get those, those weaknesses in. So it's, it's surprisingly complicated, but you can wrap your head around it. Like they introduce it to you at a really good pace. Okay. Uh, you did mention the review that it, although it is the best part of the game in many ways, it does get a little old after a while. Oh, it sure does. Uh, and that can be said <laughs> for a lot of the game. <laughs> in fact, um, I, I'd say that you can chalk most of the failures of the game up to repetitiveness. Um, because once, once you have all the tools in your hands, it's re- every battle becomes trivial. You'll, you'll only fall, you know, run into, 
two or three boss fights in the game that'll actually make you use your items or, or anything that'll actually give you a run in any way, shape or form. Um, otherwise, since you can freely swap out characters, you can always swap in someone who's got the right weaknesses to hit. Um, and since you've got all of those characters, you've got so much HP for them to have to drill through before they can actually lower your party size. Cause you can even swap out dead party members at, at will. Uh-huh. Um, it becomes just kind of going through the motions and this, this nice big complex kind of battlefield scene, you can't really auto battle through it. It thankfully has a fast forward button, which can help a little bit, but Uh um, it requires just enough engagement that you can't really turn your brain off completely. Um, But you don't really have to engage it thoughtfully either. (laughs) Okay. Well, outside of the combat of the game, uh, and I guess the main plot, there are sides, it's an RPG. There are side quests. Uh, were there any side quests in this game that really caught your attention or entertained you, or were they mostly just kind of generic and fairly boring? Most of them are generic fetch quests. The ones that God, are... jeez. Yeah, it's it's kind of unfortunate. Um, a lot of them do have, like, returning characters from uh, the series, so, like, you'll you'll see these, these strange characters every once in a while um, that you had only met in the series before, and, you know, they get this nice little, you know, welcome back uh, fan service moment. Um, but a lot of those ended up being pretty paper thin and they left out a lot of the more interesting characters. The ones that really landed are there are these bounty missions um, that have a long uh, stretch where they're not really present in the game. Um, but the first time you go through them, every bounty that you're fighting is trying to impersonate a character from the original series. And if you're a fan of the series and you see these people's kind of blundering attempts to be these iconic characters, um, those are actually pretty entertaining and they're not too long in the tooth. You, you go, you find this person, you get an entertaining scene, and you you take them down. Um, those were the ones that really stood out to me as like, okay, this is like good fan service. This is something that fans will actually get a kick out of. Okay, so, uh, well, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, I think the game looks gorgeous, but that's primarily based on what I've seen from trailers. Um, in your opinion, have you, since you are very familiar with One Piece, how does the game look, especially when compared to its animated counterpart? It looks honestly pretty amazing like 99% of the time. So they um, really translated it. They really did and it's really at its best when you use your any of your special attacks, you know, the, the equivalent of magic or, or what have you um, are taken generally directly from the show and they're mm-hmm. animated so lovingly. They're given, you know, their own unique camera angles, the voice acting from the original, all the voice actors from the original series are here. Um, so they're giving their their best and it sounds and looks just like you remember it except for you know, more dynamic and more stylish because you're working at a, you know, in a really gorgeous uh, graphics in- engine. Mm. Um, so for the most part, like this really hits it. You can really see, uh, especially Oda, the the manga creator's designs really pop. Those monster designs, even if they can get a bit repetitive, are like absolutely stunning, full of personality uh, and are rendered great. Um, environments are surprisingly well translated <laughs> from the original. Mm-hmm. Like they, they have to reorient kind of how things would look just to fit an RPG sized map mm-hmm. um, so that you're not wandering across these enormous cities. But otherwise um, you tend to be in some pretty gorgeous locales throughout the the whole thing. Um, really the only issue that I had with it was that occasionally um, their models can be a little bit too strict when it comes to delivering story scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, so it can look fine if they're doing like a, a pre-rendered, um, you know, a CG scene. But generally speaking, the expressions on characters' faces are kind of the expressions that they're going to have. They might have like two or three um, different ones, but they they don't emote as well as I would really hope, which keeps them feeling a little bit more plasticky than the very cartoonish designs of the manga and the anime. How was the music compared to its animated counterpart then? Because you did mention in the review that the music was fine. Yeah, it's it's a little bit disappointing because the music in the anime is really iconic. And I think you go into this hoping that they'll be able to use some of those motifs and riff on those, those tracks, um, especially because each character has uh, a unique theme or more than one unique theme uh, within the, the series. Um, but that doesn't really happen here. Uh, instead, we have uh, Matoi Sakuraba. Hey, he's coming up again. Uh, mm-hmm. Soundtrack. Um, and he's he's working at his most like tales here, kind of where, you know, a lot of very similar sounding tracks that could be interchangeable in you know, any of a half dozen other games. And I know this is blasphemous. There are some big Matoi Sakuraba fans out there. I am not negating you. I, <laughs> but but um, I think that he has... Uh, kind of different levels that he works at for different games. And this isn't like peak Sakuraba. Although to his credit, he does bring in some of the instruments that are more 
iconic to one piece, especially some of the brass and some of those, uh, those tracks. And there are a few that really do feel like, okay, I could see this in the anime and it would work out. Um, it's just the vast majority of them are like, we needed, we needed a song for a desert town. So here is an RPG song for a desert town. That's interesting. I wonder why they didn't use any of the composers from the actual series. I've got to think that there are like licensing issues or something. It seems like that's always the answer with Japanese media. Uh, licensing gets complicated, but I don't know. I would have absolutely loved a more anime centric soundtrack, but you know what we got, it does the job. Yeah, because I mean, the show, there are composers for the show, as I understand it, that I yes. looked up. So it's just, it's very, very strange that they did not work on this. At least not, I mean, I'm assuming that maybe some of their themes made an appearance. I was hoping so, but nothing that I caught. Now, I haven't watched the Weird. anime as far as I've read the manga, so there's a possibility that I might have missed a little something. But the main themes that you hear are definitely not present. Okay, and this is a continuation of the anime series rather than the manga. Yeah, it definitely feels, both are, are pretty similar, but this feels more anime inspired especially since they got all the voice actors back. See, that's really too bad, because this sounds like it really could have been something special, uh, especially for many fans of the series. Um, if the, by, like, they, they've gotten, they got so many things right, it sounds, yeah. but then it sounds like, you know, they skimped out some of the music. Uh, they really relied on repetition to make the game feel longer, which killed the overall momentum of the story. Mm -hmm. And that's too bad. They got real close. I thought I was going to be giving it a glowing review for the first 15 hours. Mm -hmm. Um it, it was a while before the repetition set in, but once it did, it set in pretty hard. This is not a, taking a shot at any other outlets, but with our at RPG fan, we uh, we complete the games. Like all of our viewers do a one, a, they don't one hundred percent the game, but they see credits roll. Uh, and the reason why that's very important is because the first fifteen hours of the game can be amazing, and then the last five to ten can just fall flat in its face, and it genuinely impacts the overall score. So when you say that, like the first fifteen hours were amazing, didn't didn't pull it didn't stick the landing that's that's disappointing yeah and and since it is you know kind of repetitive and padded those 15 hours unfortunately represent a smaller percentage of the game than i would have liked well if i i'm just curious if, like i do not like i mentioned i don't have any familiarity with this series i looked at the wiki page and was like nope um but if someone was to play one piece odyssey as their introduction to the one piece universe do you think they would walk away wanting more or do you think they would say, yeah, it's not for me? I think it depends. If if you're not, if you were more of an RPG neophyte, if this was one of your earlier RPGs that you had ever tried and you were usually a fan of other games, I think it might actually do something for you um, hmm. because you don't have as, as quite as broad of a basis for comparison and this will still feel novel to you. Um, I think some of the reason why this dips into repetitiveness is because I mean, how many RPGs have I played over my lifetime? I mm -hmm. know those beats, and this isn't really stepping outside of them and trying to create something new. Um, I think that a lot of the fan service that's in there, a lot of the references are going to be lost. But I know that for some people, that can be an encouragement. Um, I've, I've definitely run into situations where I've entered something in the middle, and it's made me even more excited to go back and figure out what I'm missing. And I think this could, in some level, work like that for some people. But... I think for the most part, it's just not dazzling enough um, mm -hmm. for a new person compared to like showing them a really cool fight scene from the anime would would do a much better job of pulling them in, I think, than this game. OK, how would you recommend? I'm not going to because I have way too much to do right now. Uh, but how would you recommend I would get into One Piece? Um, if you have the the stomach for reading manga, um, stomach might not be the right term, but I'm going with it. Um, the manga, you know, you can read at your own pace. There's less filler. There's You can burn through it really quickly, and you'll find yourself wanting to because the story is so good. I don't mm -hmm. think there's anything wrong with watching the anime. I think a lot of people fell in love through the anime, and especially in recent years, the animation is dynamite next-level stuff. But um, I don't know. I'll always point people toward the manga. <laughs> All right. Well, that is... Uh... Good to know if I ever decide to dive in. Um, well, I want to thank both of you for being here today. And I know it was actually a, a longer a longer day than usual because you were watching the Nintendo Direct as well, uh, which is always entertaining, but it does take some focus to get through. So thank you both for joining me this evening. I really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, always happy to come on. Well, that's good to know. Um, I would also like to thank you for listening. Uh, if anyone out there would like to figure out a way to support us here at RPG Fan, a great way to do so would be to check out our store. You can find it at www.rpgfan.com shop. 
And there you can find things like mugs and clothing items. Onesies are popular. Uh, and we are going to have some more merch in the very near future with our 25th anniversary logo on it. So if you would like to support us by purchasing some stuff, uh, check it out there at rpgfan.com slash shop. Uh, this is one of our podcasts, Random Encounter, but there are two other podcasts here at RPG Fan. Uh, that includes Retro Encounter. Right now, uh, the game that is being played is Ogre Battle 64, Person of a Lordly Caliber, which is a classic of the genre for the N64, obviously, because it ends in 64, and only only games that are on the Nintendo 64 end in 64. Um, there are going to be two episodes on that, and then following those two episodes, we're going to be doing a two-parter on Star Tropics and Zoda's Revenge, Star Tropics 2, and I'm going to be hosting those two. Uh, it's been fascinating playing these games again that I played when I was a kid and seeing how they hold up and seeing, frankly, why these two first-party Nintendo games that were never released in Japan but were only released in the West never actually developed into a franchise uh, when a lot of work was put into them and a lot of care. Uh, so that'll be fascinating. So that's coming up next month. Uh, we also have Rhythm Encounter, which is RPG Fans Music Podcast. Uh, the latest episode that came out last week is Airships, Buses, and Cannons. So this is focused on uh, modes of travel in RPGs, uh, and this is going to be some of the music that we associate with that. So uh, if you ever wonder about uh, if you ever wondered about that, give it a listen because it's a, it's a fun. It was a fun episode to edit. I really had a good time editing it. So give it a listen. If you'd like to get in contact with us here at Random Encounter, you can fire us off a message at podcast at rpgfan.com. I would love to hear from you. Uh, you know, if you have any ideas for future episodes or comments about some of our past episodes, if you have any ideas for discussion questions, we haven't done a lot of discussion questions lately because we've been, uh, We've been running close. I've been trying to keep the I've been trying to keep the show to about an hour for everyone. But uh, if you have a discussion question that really catches our attention, yeah, we'll throw it in there and ask the panel. Uh, if you'd like to send me an email, you can do so at jlogan at rpgfan.com. You can also find me at John o. Logan at mastodon.social. And uh, that's my Mastodon account. I again it's I, I have a I have a feeling about Mastodon because Mastodon is you can still post on Mastodon, and right now, at, the, at this very moment, you can't on Twitter unless you are doing some workarounds. So yeah, check me out on Mastodon. Uh, but I am not the only person on here with an online presence. Brian, where can we find you online? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at ActualLizardTTV, which, as you might expect, is also my Twitch. And Wes, where can we find you online? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Wes Iliff for as long as Twitter exists. Maybe I'll be joining you on Mastodon soon. <laughs> Well, if you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to share it with your friends. Help us get the word out there and rate us on iTunes or your other podcast player of choice. Or if you would like, you could fire us off a, uh, a review. We'd love if you posted a review. I'd love to read them. Uh, again, Brian and Wes, thank you so much for joining me this evening. I really, really appreciate it. Anytime. Yeah. Cool. And uh, to everyone out there listening, whatever you're playing, have fun.